Hi folks, Dr. Phil Jenkins here. We're going to be talking about some of the main points of Iris Marion Young's famous article, The Five Faces of Oppression. Iris Marion Young was born in New York City and got her PhD in philosophy from Penn State University in 1974. She was a political theorist focusing on social justice. She was a professor of political science for a long time at the University of Chicago until her untimely death in 2006. She very much believed in the importance of political activism and always encouraged students to become involved in their communities. In Five Faces of Oppression, Young begins by discussing her conception of justice. Justice, she says, refers to the way institutions develop and exercise individual capacities and collective communication. Therefore, if justice consists of institutions helping individuals to exercise their capacities, then injustice would refer to oppression and domination. She next explains the concept of oppression she intends to use. When we think of oppression in its traditional sense, we tend to focus our attention on the political oppression of a dictator, violently and viciously preventing people from voting or protesting or openly speaking their mind. In this paper and in most of the papers we will read in this course, oppression will be used more broadly to refer to situations in which people suffer some inhibition of their ability to develop their own capacities and to be able to express their thoughts and feelings because they are part of a group. So many groups in our society are oppressed according to this definition. For example, people of color. Note here that the term uh, colored is antiquated, but the acceptable, more appropriate term is people of color. Uh, some folks occasionally um, make that little uh, mistake there. So people of color, Chicanos, Puerto Ricans, American Indians, Jews, gay men, lesbians, Arabs, old people, working class people, the disabled, etc. are oppressed under this definition. Young argues that oppression names a family of concepts. Oops, sorry, let me go back here a little bit. Young argues that oppression names a family of concepts and conditions that she divides into five categories. We'll discuss the five categories after a brief discussion of the structural sense of oppression she wants to employ. When Young uses the word oppression, she tends not to mean it in an individual sense, but rather in a structural sense. This is perhaps one of the most important concepts in a race and class and gender course. Usually when we think of sexism, for example, we think of an individual person saying demeaning things to women. So we say this person is a sexist. Though this is an important sense of sexism, it pales in comparison, many of our theorists think, to structural sexism, which is sexism that is embedded in our social practices that we don't realize are there. Similarly for Young, the important aspect of oppression is the one that designates the injustice to some groups because of the everyday practices of a well-intentioned liberal society. It is structural insofar as it is embedded in unquestioned norms, habits, and symbols. Oppressions are systematically reproduced, so we cannot get rid of structural uh, oppression just by eliminating rulers or making new laws. Again, this is not oppression in the sense of individual people having the intent to hurt other people. Instead, this is oppression in the sense of unquestioned assumptions that we all have, so that many of us are adding to the oppression of subordinated groups without even realizing that we're doing it. We'll explore more examples of this structural oppression throughout the course. Now, by group, young means something very specific. A group is a collective of persons differentiated from at least one other group by cultural forms, practices, and uh, or a way of life. She contrasts aggregates 
and associations with groups. An aggregate is any classification of persons according to some attribute. So a group of people could come together to or be classified as a group in the sense of an aggregate if they have at least one thing in common. Say, for instance, blue eyes, or they work for the government, or they have long hair, and so on. An association is a group that's formally organized. So, for instance, a club or a football team would be examples of associations. The thing about aggregates and associations that's important to understand is, they, is that they exist only after individuals exist. In other words, individuals have their own sense of identity and sense of self independent of an aggregate or an association. Groups, on the other hand, in the sense that Jung means it, constitute individuals. The group defines the individual, at least to some degree. So being Jewish or being black, or being disabled or being a woman, is part of what defines the individuals in these groups. Someone who is a member of an aggregate or an association, on the other hand, is not someone who tends to be defined by that collection of people. Let me make a distinction between atomism and holism. An atomist perspective of social groups says that groups are nothing more than a collection of individuals, so that the group has very little to do with the sense of self the individuals in that group have. So aggregates and, asso uh, and associations are atomist, like atoms. Jung's conception of a group, on the other hand, is holistic. The group makes the individual in the sense that a group helps define each individual's sense of who they are. Many of the theorists we will be discussing in this course will hold that theories of justice should not presume atomism. They should not presume that an individual is unified, free, self-made, or stands apart from their membership of the group of which they are a member. A person joins an association, but one finds oneself as a member of a group. group uh, groups exist only in relation to other groups, so that a group may be identified by outsiders. Many writers argue, for instance, that the category of race was invented by people in the 17th century who wanted to justify slavery. Group membership in and of itself is not oppressive. For instance, Young says that Roman Catholics in the United States are a group, in her sense, but being Roman Catholic is not oppressive anymore. Whether or not a group is oppressed depends on whether they have one or more of five conditions. There is no common nature that all groups share, according to Young. They are fluid. They come into being and they pass away. Group differences frequently cut across one another so that being black uh, for instance, is not just a matter of being a member of a simple, unified group with a common life. <clears throat> People are often members of more than one group, so someone may be Jewish and disabled, uh, or black and lesbian, or working class and Roman Catholic, and so on. Now this is the first, this is the end of the first part of a two-part video um, series. Uh, the second part uh, in the second video, uh, in there I will discuss the five faces of oppression. Thank you for listening.